I got introduced to politics at the age of seven when my father ran against um, Joseph Gallo. So at seven years old, I didn't know this. But, you know, understanding as you move forward and getting the history of it, when you were African-American in the Bronx, mm -hmm. so, so the, the Democratic leadership was Jewish. Mm -hmm. When you were African-American in the Bronx, you went to Joseph Gallo. Mm -hmm. When you were Puerto Rican, not Latino, Puerto Rican. Latino comes later on with more Dominicans and, and more Latinos coming into the Bronx at the time was Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. You went to Ramon Bellas. Mm -hmm. And the Jewish leadership, whether it was Stanley Friedman, George Friedman, you know, Pat, Pat Cunningham and those guys, what they would do if you were African American or Latino and you went to them for their support, they would say, go to Joseph Gallagher or go to Ramon then there were people who were um, sort of like their own leaders in their own right who didn't want to go to those yeah. folks. So Herman Badillo was one of them. Helena mm -hmm. um, Valentin was another one. And then my father is an acolyte of Herman Badillo. Mm -hmm. So Herman Badillo wanted to run for mayor. Herman Badillo you know, would never sit down with Ramon Valens. Herman Badillo wanted to get the attention of people in the Bronx, namely the African-American establishment. Mm -hmm. So in 1980, when uh, State Senator Joseph Gallagher, who was not just a state senator, he was the leader of the, the Blacks. Herman Badillo tells his young acolyte, Ru Reverend Ruben Diaz, we're going to run against this guy, you know, to shake their boots. Because back then, you collect petitions, yeah. but then you negotiate. Right. And you can withdraw a candidacy depending on what else you want. Right. But my father's is Cabe Siduro. <laughs> and my father didn't want to listen to Herman Badillo. Mm -hmm. When Herman Badillo said, okay, I got what I needed from uh, Joseph Gallagher. I need you to get out of the race. Oh. My father still made that race. So that was my introduction to politics. Wow. So my father didn't have an order now with Herman Badillo. Oh my gosh. This is like uh, uh, 1980. Yeah. This, Herman Badillo was his leader. Got into a order now because Herman Badillo now already made a, an arrangement with Joseph Gallagher, yeah. but now he needs to get his guy out. His guy got uh, what we call candiditis, and he didn't want to get out of the race. So Bobby, you know, runs the race with two or three pelegatos, you know, helping him out. Yeah. And we were the, I was seven years old, my brother was nine, my sister. So we used to, almost every night, it's expensive now. I'm, 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 I'll digress, don't worry, we'll get into it. But, um, we, my father used to buy, I remember clearly, uh, like it was yesterday, the 100 hamburgers from from White Castle. Uh -huh. At the time, they were 30 cents each. So if you bought 100, it was only $30. Oh my gosh. So every night, and we didn't mind. We love White Castle. <laughs> every night, you get the giant box yeah. of 100. That's all we ate. That's all the, the campaign could afford. Every night while we put up posters with the glue, it, it, it was, um, then it was an outlaw. But there was like this glue that looked like oatmeal. Right. And you had it in buckets. And you would you have brushes and you have glue fights and everything. <laughs> oh man! And, but so that, like that was my introduction to it. But um, through it all, people like Ramon Belles, whether people want to admit it or not, they would not be as strong as he was without folks like um, uh, Federico Perez, without folks like Georgie. These were his like his lieutenants, and even more than that, his his captain. And they're the ones who made that, you know, what was um, Paul Mejias? That was another one with the big glasses, okay. you know. So these were all Ramon Velez's crew. Mm -hmm. And so they were always omnipresent. But the point is this, that my father had all of these fights throughout the years, um, including with Georgie, Ramon Velez. I just told you about um, Edmond Badillo and so many others, even Fernando Ferret. So when I got into politics, when I got into politics in 1994 and I wanted for district leader, I made a rule that I didn't want to inherit my father's friends uh, and I didn't want to inherit his enemies. Right. That I wanted to make my own friends right. and make my own enemies, fully understanding who was who. Right. Georgie, Georgie, unlike some others, never ever treated me like the Reverend son. Georgie always treated me like Ruben Diaz Jr., my own person. Own person. And that's what I've always appreciated about.
And so with Georgia, you either continue that, that loving relationship or you mess it up, but I want to do it on my own. Exactly. And so that's what I, I don't have bad stories about Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> now I can start. That, that is a great introduction. We, <laughs> we appreciate that. And uh, welcome to the Legacy Pioneers Oral History Initiative, a part of the Bronx Latino History Project. Today is Thursday, August 24th, 2023. My name is Pastor Crespo Jr., the research librarian for the Bronx County Historic Society. I'm here with Michelle Jordan, who will co-interview this oral history. Michelle, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. So my name is Michelle Jordan. I am a current graduate student at the Palmer School of Library and Information Science and creator of the Legacy Pioneers Oral History Initiative. Um, this initiative is spearheaded from the physical archival collection of my late grandfather, George Rodriguez, Community Advisory Board Chairman of Lincoln Hospital, and Bronx Community Board 1 for over 30 years. Um, and the aim is really to fully capture the voices, experiences, and spirit of community leaders of the South Bronx. Okay. And today we are joined by Ruben Diaz Jr., former New York State Assembly member, former Bronx Borough President, and currently serving as Senior Vice President for Strategic Initiatives at the Montefiore Medical Center. Welcome, sir. Thank Would you. you like to introduce yourself? I think you did a pretty good job. But I'm, I'm excited <laughs> to be here, and um, you know, nothing warms my heart more than to pay homage uh, to those whose shoulders we stand on, and George Rodriguez is certainly one of those individuals. Great. Usually we start out all our old histories by asking you your family history and background, and I would still like you to do that, although your father was here just a couple of weeks ago. Just tell us about your understanding and your perspective of where your family comes from in Puerto Rico, you know, and their history. So my father is from Atoteja, Bayamón, uh, from a little barrio called La Cuchilla. He joined the military uh, and from I don't know how much in depth you want me to go into that, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to package it and then we can go in from there. He joined the military that brought him to New York in Brooklyn. He started working in factories in um, the garment district. My mother um, came at the age of 12 with my grandmother, my grandfather, and all of her siblings. And they moved to Washington Heights. At, a, at an early age, they all had to work as well. It's different from, from today's times. Mm -hmm. So mommy and, and all of my titis also worked in the garment industry. So my father, as the story goes, he worked in one factory, she worked in another, and they were um, sort of adjacent to each other. And during lunch break, you know, there was an intermingling of workers from both factories. They meet each other, they fall in love. Um, as they start dating, probably leaves Brooklyn and goes to Washington Heights. Uh, when, they start their, um, when they start their family, I'm the youngest of three siblings. My sister Damaris, my brother Sam, and I, they moved to the to the Bronx. And, and, and a lot of people don't realize that the migration of the Puerto Ricans from New York City starts in Brooklyn. From Brooklyn is to the Lower East Side. From the Lower East Side is what we call El Barrio, East, East Harlem. Mm -hmm. From East Harlem, eventually they made their way uh, to the South Bronx. Uh, I um, went to PS5 on 149th Street. I was born in, I was born in, um, on, on a walk up in, on Whale Street in the South Bronx. And then the way the story goes is we were too big of a family, a family of five for that apartment. And they went, my family then goes to their borough president's office at Mambarillo. And he had um, one of his folks there named Doño Burgos. Doño Burgos helps my family, my parents to get an apartment in the New York City Housing Authority, more houses, 525 Jackson Avenue, apartment 13k wow. and so we moved into a bigger apartment right across the street from ps5 my brother sister and i go to ps5 at, at the, in the in the second grade i was identified as um uh, gifted and talented so i went to ps31 in the grand concourse from ps31 in the grand concourse i went to Clark junior high school 149 and that was on 145th street in Willis. Then I went to Lehman High School, transferred in my senior year, chasing after a young lady that I was totally head over heels for. We went to Stevenson High School, which was the zone school to where we were living on St. Lawrence. We moved from Jackson to, to the Soundview section of the Bronx. And um, yeah, that young lady and I are still married today. 
35. Well, we celebrate our boyfriend girlfriend anniversary. <laughs> and so September 6th, we'll make 35 years together. We have two sons, Ruben and Ryan. Ruben will be 31 in December. Ryan is 28 years old. And um, I got introduced to politics at the age of seven when my father first ran against Joseph Galbraith in 1980. Uh, he ran in 1985 for the city council against Daniela Colon. And then he ran in 1990 for the New York State Assembly against David Rosado. He lost all three times. In 1994, I was part of a slate that he was putting together. I, for district leader, I won that race against Gumercindo Martinez. Uh, Gumercindo, Cartañera Colon, David Rosado, um, you know, these are all names that were part of the, the political club or the political army, if you want, if I can use that word, that was headed by the late, great Ramon Velez. And George Rodriguez was very much a part of that. Uh, in 1996, I ran, and, and I, I, that's a fascinating story. I ran for the first time for the assembly and lost that race. I was 21 years old, 20, 22 years old and lost against County. 23, I wind up winning, became the youngest member of the New York State Assembly, served for seven terms. Um, in 19, I'm sorry, in 2009, the former Bronx Borough President, Adolfo Carillon, went on to serve under President Barack Obama, and that left a vacancy and I ran from the assembly to become the Bronx Borough President in a special election. And then I did three terms as the Bronx Borough President. Wow, wow. And talking about you being the youngest person elected to the New York State Assembly since at the Theodore time. Roosevelt. At the time, yes. So that, that's a great milestone, a great marker for you. Yeah, it was, um, I, I, that's what people say. It was, I think it was more indicative of my Naivete, <laughs> you know, you, you just, if, if, knowing what I know now, I don't know if I would recommend a 22 year old or a 23 year old to run for the New York State Assembly. That's a lot. That's a lot. It can be a lot. And just to go back a little, could you tell us about your earliest recollections of the neighborhood you grew up in in Soundview? Well, unlike most of the guys that I grew up with, I had like a, a, a dual life or dual communities. Because remember, we were born and raised in the South Bronx. My father's a, a pillar in the South Bronx. When, when you listen to the to the opening song of the Jeffersons, moving on up to the east side. So when you were Puerto Rican and you did better for yourself, you moved to the East Bronx. But we, so my brother and sister and I, we always went to school in the South Bronx, District 7. At the age of four, we moved to the Soundview section of the Bronx. So I've always, I went to school all the way up to middle, to middle school um, in the South Bronx. And, you know, all of the campaigns and, and you know, all of, we had, we had so many friends and friends of the family sit in the South Bronx. So I grew up not only in the Soundview section of the Bronx, in the Bronx, but I also grew up in Southern Boulevard where Bobby had the Christian Community in Action, Christian Community, Benevolent Association, Casa Boricua. And so I remember there growing up in rubble. If you look at Fort Apache, the Bronx, the movie, The Fort Apache, the Bronx, at the, the final scene where, they, where, Lou, where Paul Newman is chasing with his partner, um, the guy who was a burglar, a thief, and he had like a pilot hat, you see all the rubble, right? Just before Paul Newman reaches out to grab him and the movie stops. You'll see Casa Boricua, and you'll see the rubble. And that's the footprint of where Jimmy Carter came and visited, and also Ronald Reagan. That's where they had the People's Convention in the Bronx. And that's where the world saw what many outside of the Bronx was trying to hide, which is the example of urban decay. We look worse than third world countries. We look, you know, we were the example of, you know, of, um, an entire community uh, that was neglected, an entire community that was left for dead. And so I'm a product of that. Um, but, I'm a, but from that comes an incredible, and I would say missing, 
activism. From that comes a resolve from so many organizations and so many different individuals. You had, I mean, you had giants like Helena Valentin, Luis Nine, Ramon Vélez, Herman Badillo, Olga Mendez, Evelina Antonetti, Antonia Pantoja. It's just, you know, so many, Georgie Rodriguez. Just, you know, you had organizations like Mid Bronx Desperado. Um, I mean, uh, United Parents, uh, the uh, Hunts Point Multi Service. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. That that started to set a solid foundation so that little boys and girls like me who were doing backflips on dirty mattresses because that's how that was like our bouncing gym who was playing in the middle of the street because our parks really didn't exist. And so everything for us was in the middle of the street, whether it was stickball, playing pole to pole, football, brown pole to pole, skelzies in the middle of the street. You know, this they were laying down the solid foundation so that um, at least there was some some hope. You know, the, the, the young Lord, I'm sorry, I didn't even mention the, the young Lord, to, you know, and, and all these elected officials that were setting the foundation so a boy or a girl like myself can hopefully get better health attention, health care, can get a better education, and can ultimately aspire to be whatever they wanted to be. In my case, I became the borough president. Wow, that, that, that's amazing. Could you, going back to, to your childhood and growing up, can you uh, tell us about the music your parents listened to at home and some of the meals you and your brothers and sisters enjoyed at home? So, my home was a little funny because Bobby, being a, an extreme conservative, devout Pentecostal minister, um, we grew up with a very strict and disciplined environment. But we also were, including my mom, behind Bobby's back. We, we loved music. And there was always, a, I remember this white stereo in our house in, in St. Long. And it had not only the record player, but it had the, the insertion for eight track tapes. Ah. And I remember we then we upgraded to that. Mommy got a big wall unit. <laughs> but on Saturdays, we play, it, it, it's, it's mind boggling the, the music that we played early on because everybody had to clean the house. And when Poppy was out of the house, the music started. And so we, I don't know if you know Pimpinela. No. Um, there were songs like Locura Tengo Por Tu Nombre, Locura Tengo Por Tu Voz, Locura Tengo Por Tu Boca, Que Me Vuelve Loco Cuando La Beso Yo. I remember Ring My Bell. I can't sing, I'm sorry. Ring My Bell. I'm working at the car wash. So, so, so there was a, there was a, I think a, a broad band of different types of music up until like the late seventies where I was introduced to hip hop and my family didn't really understand that. Uh, I remember listening to the Cold Crush Brothers. I remember going to see Wild Style, the movie and see Bobby's nephew, um, son of, of Tita and, and Dio, um, and, and he was Ruby D, and they were and they were part of a of a crew that always battled the Cold Cross Brothers. And in the movie The Wild Side, there's this scene when they're in the basketball court, and I remember going with the fellas to uh, to see the movie. And when I saw Ruby D, a little fly MC, and we're pulling all the ladies, and they were very melodic in the way they delivered their rhyme. When you scream and shout, they all seem to go crazy. A Ruby D, a Ruby D. And I'm like, that's my cousin. You know? <laughs> it was, it was mind blowing. Um, and I used to wear my baseball cap to the side um, when you, when you, there was b-boying and, and break dancing. And so we said, wear white gloves and popped in locks. I used to have white gloves and the hoodie and the, and the, the jeans. We had Lee jeans, but then you put baby pins on the side. And you crisscross from the top to the bottom, shoelaces. You wore 
I remember my, I, at the age of 12, I bought my first pair of shell toe beaters. And I didn't tie the shoelaces and got fat shoelaces that you iron. And you had the lead jeans with the La Tiger shirt. So if you wore a burgundy La Tiger shirt with gray lead jeans, your Adidas had to have a burgundy shoelaces. If you wore the, the beige La Tiger shirt with, you know, with black, then your, you know, your shoelaces either had to be black or beige. And you stretch them out and you iron them and you press them. And then you had a puffy sock inside of the tongue so you could lift up the tongue. And the puffy shoelaces, you know, were even bigger than that. And my parents hated every minute of it. My DTs were like, oh, he's trying to act black. And this and that. And I said, write rhymes. And, you know. So, yeah, music, music is very much part of my DNA. Everything from Find Your All Stars to Motown to you know, um, 70s and 80s R&B to early stages of hip hop going all the way through the 80s, freestyle music, house music. Everybody knows no matter what stage I've been in life that, that music is a big part of me. In fact, I'm a re recovering politician now. And as you stated earlier, I'm a senior vice president at Montefiore, but I do, I follow other passions. And as the borough president, I started the initial financing and got my friends in government to finance the hip hop museum, which will be open in about another year, maybe a year and a half, 60,000 square feet. And so I, now I sit on the board of the hip hop museum. I've sort of carved out a little lane for me that everybody knows how much I love hip hop. And, and so aside from being a community leader or former community elected official, I'm now known in the hip hop so both from old school hip hop to con contemporary hip hop. And, I'm sorry. Oh, and going off that, Mr. Diaz, um, because the Bronx really has a rich, diverse cultural history. Mm -hmm. And just as you were saying, how do you view the role of culture and heritage in shaping the identity of the borough? And it goes hand in hand, right? Yeah, and how because do the Bronx he, preserve that? Because the the so if you if you want to look at the Bronx and Again, I don't know how long-winded you guys want me to be, but you, if you want to put it in perspective, it's important to tell the entire story of the borough, the people, and how the people, depending on the time in that day and age, um, created culture, created music, created a, a way of life, right, that the rest of the world understands. So, the Bronx, I don't have, I'm in the historical society here. We're the only one of three places in the world with the with the with the you know with the word the in front of it. Mm -hmm. And it, you know that derives there's different stories, but um, if, if my history serves me correct, it derives from initially Jonas Bronx settling in the Bronx, and you spell his name B R O N C K, and many people from the southern part of what we know as Manhattan now. Mm -hmm. But even you know at the time, it, it's not what we thought. It was like below 14th Street. Then it expanded to be below, below 42nd Street. When you went on vacation, you went up to the Bronx Estate, mm -hmm. and there was a river that ran through the Bronx Estate. So once the Jonas Bronx and his family were no longer around, people just went up to that river that ran through the Bronx Estate, known as the Bronx River. So the X comes from like the you know shortening was like shorthand. See. Uh -huh. They took the B-R-O-N-C-K apostrophe S, yeah. made into X. And, and so we went from a place where you vacationed here. It was God's country. You needed fresh air from all the smog in the, in the southern part of Manhattan to come to the Bronx. Uh, fast forward the, the early, you know, in the, 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 30, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, when you made it, from Manhattan, where did you move? To the Bronx. The Grand Concourse is 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 shaped, um, you know, the Bronx the, from the the, the Champ Alize mm -hmm. in Paris. But then there was white flight. People started leaving, yeah. and when people started leaving, and new faces started coming in, brown faces, black faces, then people started burning their buildings to get insurance. It's a very cynical, dark malicious story that a lot of people don't care to talk about or a lot of people don't know but but it was systemic 
and it was premeditated. And in my opinion, it was evil. Um, and, and they left us for dead. And so, so the same way that our rich history comes from a place that we were the place that everybody wanted to vacation and come to, when everybody turned their backs on us and burned down their properties because they didn't necessarily want to be landlords to people that looked differently than they did, and those that stayed here, then you get a, a, a uh, resilient youth banging on tables or banging on pipes or using their music from, you know, you know, from, from Motown or having two turntables, taking a break. So if you ask my friend, my brother Flash, Grandmaster Flash, who's one of the pioneers of hip hop, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary even though Ku Herc is the father of hip hop because he started the party in, in 1973 in um, Sedgwick Avenue with two turntables. What Herc did was that he was able to play different records and keep the party going. What Flash did is that he took 30 seconds of the same record. So if you look at somebody like James Brown, so James Brown got this, I want you to hit me. It's like if you like salsa. No le pega la negra. So there comes a point where in that song, if you were a salsa dancer, and I wish I was a great salsa dancer, you are killing the floor. You are really cutting the rug because they let that, you know, that salsa rhythm go and, and there's no vocals over it. And you're just dancing, and it just is mind-boggling. So Flash was, hated the lyrics, not hated the lyrics, but he could do without the lyrics. And he would take a song like Want You to Hit Me, bam, 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 but it would only be 30 seconds of a six-minute song or 20 seconds. So he wound up taking the turntables, and he found a way to take the same record, and he would take 30 seconds and convert it to 30 minutes. So not everybody, I want you to hit me, bam, 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 bam. And then, and then, and then, and then, and then, and everybody's doing all the, you know, and they're shimmying it up and doing all the break, all the, um, you know, the, the, the moves of the day. And you kept the party going, same record, 30 seconds into 30 minutes until you change. So the point is to your question, I know that's a long one, but people have to understand this, that when you look at our DNA, when you look at the trajectory of the history of the borough, this is, if you look at salsa, salsa is mambo. Mambo is the, is, is the, is the origins of salsa from Cuba. But what we had is like people like um, Willie Colon and, and La Fania All Stars, they put a little sauce on it. They, they, they mixed up, they took, they took mambo and did something extra to it. And then you had different cultural clubs in the Bronx. The cultural clubs were named after the, the places, uh, the towns that you came from, the pueblos of Puerto Rico. El, el Club Ponce, Pon, Ponceño, you know, the, you know, the, you know, you have from um, um, uh, Yauco, uh, de Bayamón, you had different clubs. And that's where the Fania all star, that's where the people who took mambo and, and practiced it with that little sauce, that's where is the cradle of salsa. That's why we're known as El Condado de la Salsa. You had the, the whites and the, um, and the Italians, right? There's something called Dua. And, and around canisters when it was cold and when there was fire burning and that's how they got warm, with acapella. This is the birthplace of Dua. And then you also get this to be the birthplace of hip hop. And, and, and so unless you understand the entire history of our borough, the people and the resiliency of, the, of those people, especially around hip hop when we didn't look so well and how they weren't gonna allow for the, the negligence of the federal government and others and banks and institutions to, to, to bring us down all the way. Now you get this music. Now you get, you know, 30 seconds turned into 30 minutes. Now you get somebody on the microphone. They start first by advertising how they have the goods, yeah. right? <laughs> but then they start rhyming mm -hmm. over it. Mm -hmm. And that's how you get the MC. Right. And then, and that's how you get people like Melly Mel mm -hmm. with songs like The Message and they become the journalists. Mm -hmm of everything that's around us. Mm -hmm. And then more and more people start getting to that. And now we start exposing the world and we start exposing the institutions, at least musically. Because mm -hmm. through it all, 
you also had the activism right. of the Georgie Rodriguez's and others exposing the powers that be that we have poor living conditions, that you know, that it was a criminal what was being done to us when people were burning down our buildings, that the sanitation department wasn't picking up our garbage like they did in other neighborhoods, that our educational system was subpar, that crime was running rampant, that our our neighbors were being infect, infested with drugs, that you know the train system didn't work here, and so on and so forth. So that's a lot. I don't know. It is, and it is. <laughs> am, I, am I giving you? Uh, Very uh, well said. I mean, this is a an academic historian could not have articulated the way you live the birth, the development, and the rise of salsa before hip hop. Uh, that comes from someone who lived it, and, and we thank you for that. So I'm, I appreciate that because I did live it, I, and it is a, it's amazing because A, it's mind-boggling. Now that I'm 50 years old and, and, and I'm a history buff, now I'm calling it criminal. Oh. And it is what it is. It, it, it was criminal. Mm -hmm. Now I'm calling it, you know, ne neglect. Back then, best life in the world. <laughs> we was having a time of my life. There's times now that I wish I could relive that. You know, back then it was, we had so much fun. We were outside. Like kids nowadays say, oh, we outside. We were outside, outside, you know? Yeah. You know, we even even my dad, um, we were one of the few kids who had like the initial Atari and Coleco vision. Yeah. Bro, I, I, I don't need to say that. <laughs> scratch that. You edit that out. Yes, sir. But if, if, if we did something unacceptable to our parents, and on a Saturday, my parents told my brother and I that we had to stay inside. Guess what? We had to stay inside and we could watch television. We could even play our Calico and we would rather die than not to go outside. We would rather die. We could still play video games. Donkey Kong, Pac-Man. We could watch TV. You punish in your room, but you could watch TV. Punish in your room, can't go outside, but you could play video. Oh my God, we would rather die. What do you want us to do? <laughs> We'd rather be outside. But now you go to our kids now. They say, stop playing video games, go outside. Yeah. And that and they would rather die, right? Yeah. So yeah, man. Uh, so so that's one. And then and then on the activism side, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I didn't want to do mm -hmm. was when my father, you know, slept us along to hear the the, the speeches. To hear the act, to see it, not fully being aware, understand. We, you know, take a kid now and they, you take them to a political rally, they're bored out of their mind. That was us. But we went, we saw the rousing speeches and the uh, the festivals, and Freddie Perez Sr. would go to the carnivals, and, and he would have, you know, Hector Lavoe play in the rubble over there on 149th Street and 3rd Avenue, not 149th Street, by, um, Maybe 150, 150 something street and third and Melrose and and El, and um and uh, Elton right yeah. that that area over there and you will see that and all you want to do is is ride the carousel but you know, Bobby wanted us to listen to the speeches and <laughs> and take the pictures with people that we didn't necessarily appreciate at the time but talking about living we we lived it we PS5 and PS25 right down the street. PS25 was the first bilingual, all bilingual school. That comes from activism. That comes from people like Antonia Pantoja, Elina Antonetti. That comes from Carmen Arroyo. That comes from Ramon Vélez. Um, that comes from Herman Badillo being the first Puerto Rican congressman and, and being the author of the National Bilingual Education Bill. Then you get the whole school. You know, we live that. My sister is a product of that bilingual education. She went from PS5 to, P, to IS 184, so did Sam. You know, and then through it all, they, through it all, they, they still were able to champion a broad spectrum of education. And I was classified as gifted and talented. So, you know, that's how I was able to get those opportunities. I can keep going. Oh, when I, please. When I went, when I went to, P, you look at, you look at Ostos Community College. You want to talk about activism? Ostos Community College was, I didn't realize it at the time, 
but I lived it when I was at PS31, which is no longer there. So from, from the Grand Concourse, think of this. I'm in the third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. My, now we already living in the Soundview section of the Bronx. So my mother would come and she would pick my sister, my brother and my sister up on, at PS5. I had to get on the bus, the 19 bus, to meet them. 19 bus, I meet them on, on um, right across the street from PS5 on uh, Jackson Avenue. And then from there, we drive to Soundview. So whenever I would walk from PS31 on the Grand Concourse, Boston's Community College was only one little building on the corner and there was trailers and there were people like um, like George. There were people like uh, um, Carmen Arroyo and others who fought for funding so that A initially can have Ostos Community College even on paper, even exists, and then B get the funding so that we can continue to build it out and make it the campus that it is today. Unbeknownst to me at the time, I'm, I'm just thinking that I'm passing uh, some construction sites but people were being taught in those trailers. And then fast forward as a member of the New York State Assembly, uh, being able to be appointed by the then speaker to the, to the higher ed CUNY, you know, Board of Trustees for Capital Projects, I was able to allocate millions of dollars to horses to Lehman and so on and so forth. As a board president, the same thing. But unbeknownst to me at the time, these are all activists. And these are all things that I'm seeing is, is being embedded in me and it made me a, a, a better um, elected official because I understood it, because I lived it, because I passed by it. So when presidents of hostels or presidents of, um, you know, of, of the different CUNY colleges came to me and I'm a product of CUNY, I'm a CUNY twofer, they didn't have to sell me on the idea. I lived it. It was embedded in me. It was indoctrinated in me. Going back to the hip hop days, you, you had mentioned that you even wrote a few rhymes, you know, and you, you expressed a lot of, a lot of, you gave us a lot of information about the b-boy lifestyle and the dress. How did you participate in hip hop, rapping, any of those elements? No, I was a, I was a fan. I was just a fan. That's, you know, I just, I just only knew hip hop from afar. <coughs> um, I used to try to write my own rhymes on and on and on, trying to do this on the freestyle. I used to be wild ever since I was a little child, hanging on the corner, you know. So, but but back then we didn't have the luxury of YouTube, we didn't have social media, so you know if you were lucky, you were able to get a Walkman for Christmas. We got tapes. I remember DJ Red Alert, who's my friend now, right? So now I'm now I'm, now all of these folks that I admired and grew up you know, listening to and being influenced by them. These are all my buddies. These are all my friends now. But like, who DJ Red Alert used to be on Hot 97? And every Friday at 8 o'clock, you hear like a siren's alarm on the radio. And that's when you knew you had to pop your, your cassette tape on your record player, on your radio, or your, or your little boom box, and press the record button. And you hear, cool DJ Red Alert. Cool, 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 cool DJ Red Alert is a great man. And that's when you heard the latest rap song. And when you tape record the rap song, what you wanted to do is on your own, on your free time, you you play it, you write the words down, reverse it, play the next verse, write it down until you get the whole song. And that's how you memorize the song. So, um, you know, songs like um, Roxanne Roxy, hey, EMD, yeah, what's up, man? Hey, go that girl they call Roxanne. She's all stuck up. Why did you say that? These are all songs that I have in my mind because I used to write them. Um, how can I move the crowd? First of all, ain't no mistakes allowed. Here's the instructions. Put it together. It's simple, ain't it? But quite clever. Some of you have been trying to write rhymes for years, but weak ideas irritate my ears. Is this the best that you can make? Because if not, if you got more, I'll wait. But don't make me wait too long, because I'm going to move on the dance floor when they put something smooth on. So turn up the bass. It's better when it's loud, because I like to move the crowd. You know, all songs I used to write, you know. And that was by Kim and, and KRS-One, and these are all my buddies. Later on in life, as a ball president, as the elected official, 
I did, you know, a lot of street fitness. And then I was the one who started bringing in the hip hop artists that I grew up with to be on the stage. But I would make them, you know, uh, let me rock the mic with them. And YouTube has a couple of those. You should look it up on YouTube. <laughs> now, you grew up a little later than the 1970s gangs, you know, era. Uh, do you have any memories of that from the, your old neighborhoods? You want to talk about any of the gang activities? And how did you see it? They were tough. So, <clears throat> if I come from what's now known as um, Sonia Sotomayor houses, but it was known as Bronx and BDP. Bronxdale Projects. In Bronxdale Projects, you had the Black Spirit. And one of the one of the pioneers of hip hop is Africa Bambada. He has his own issues. Nobody really talks about Africa Bambada. You can research that. But you can't talk about the origins of hip hop or gangs without speaking of Africa Bambada. Africa Bambada's brother was one of the big guys of the Black Spades. Africa Bambada, somebody takes him to Africa. And that's when he changed his name to Africa Bambada. But he was able to study and see Zulu tribes. He's the one who brings that over and says, no matter what gang you're in, even if you're Latino, and I consider myself an Afro-Latino, you all know who my dad is and what my dad looks like. He said, we all come from Africa, and so we're all part of a Zulu nation. And that's how you start to create, they start to create the Zulu nation, a big umbrella group. And, and, and it got to a place where they all made peace with each other. But I grew up seeing the Savage Skulls with their cuts. Um, um, the tingling. I remember like on Webster, they had like a whole big storefront, the tingling, the, 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 the black spades. And then later on in the 80s, like on my block, we had the Royals crew. It turned into never sober crew. People used to wear the beads and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And um, but it, but it was it was all around us, and uh, whether they had beads on, jackets, or, you know what they call the cuts, um, you saw it all around us. Yeah. Wow, wow, you such an interesting life you lived. Uh, fast forward, uh, moving on to your New York State Assembly tenures, twelve years, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Twelve and a half. Twelve and a half years. Could you? No, no, no. Oh, I'm sorry, 13 and a half years, seven terms, seven terms. I didn't finish my, my seventh term. It would have been 14 terms, uh, 14 years. So every year is two terms. Got it. Did so you, I, I, did, I did 13 and a half years in the assembly and 12 and a half years in the borough. And you, you know, just looking at your background, you've worked on a lot of legislative issues during your time at the New York State Assembly. Are there any major challenges that you want to speak about? Any legislative efforts that that were dear to you that you worked hard to pass? All of them. Um, everything from making sure that we protected our CUNY students. Um, I have a bunch of pen. I still have them in storage. Like pen certificates. Uh, issues dealing with asthma where kids couldn't carry the asthma pump on their person in schools. Right. My wife is a, a chronic asthmatic. Uh, everything from, you know, making sure that we did more on affordable housing. The, the, it's, it's always a challenge, because when you're up in Albany, remember that no matter who you think you are, no matter where you come from, you still have to deal with not only your house, in my case, the assembly, but then the Senate, so in the assembly, there's 150. So there's 149 other people that you have to convince. Then you have to then you have to convince the Senate, um, the 63 senators, state senators. And if you can convince the majority in your house, and if semi in the Senate picks up your bill and they can convince the majority of people in the Senate, the governor still has to sign it into law. And there's so many different competing interests. The problem with politics and the people's perception of politics. They say, well, politicians are corrupt. Politicians are liars. The overwhelming majority of politicians are good-hearted, hardworking individuals who want to do the best that they can. The problem is that when you're a candidate, you don't understand the complexities 
of where you go when you should. And so you say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And then number two, when you're there, then you got to try to convince so many other people who not everybody thinks like you or us. And that doesn't make them bad. It's just that everybody has different challenges for different communities. So everybody's doing the best they can to represent where they come from and the people that they represent. And that may not be in sync with what you want. So there comes the clash. And then you have, then every and everybody has all these friends and interest groups. And that, and that's turned into a bad word, but it's not a bad word. All of these competing interests that they're trying to prioritize. And so it gets really, really murky and gray. And because then you're not able to deliver or stop some of the things that you said that you would deliver or stop when you were a candidate, then you disappoint people. And so they think that you're a liar or they think that you sold them out because there's really not enough time to explain all those complexities because Albany is this, this place 155 miles away and not everybody goes up there and see how the sausage is made. Right. I don't know if I answered your question. You did. You did. Uh, that, was, that was a great response. Um, now, just only a few years into your first tenure in 1999, uh, Hamadou Diallo. we had this Hamadou Diallo. Could you tell us why uh, it was so important for you to advocate and support that family and tell us about the experiences you had during the, that incident? So being on the block, my block was pretty rough. So my block was a perpendicular to Bronx there. So it was pretty rough. Sammy and I, in our house, we didn't have it rough. In our house, we were the only ones who had our own biological father still living at home. We had, you know, inside of our home, we had a good. But when you walked outside, you know, I was nobody's victim either. You can't, you got to... And then the fellas you grew up with, I've known them since four years old, five years old. That becomes a brotherhood. Many of us are still in contact today. And so you, you know, if your brothers get into something, then you get into something, right? But, so I'm sorry, your question again was? Just your experiences on, on your advocacy and your support for the, the Alu family. So, so we, growing up, we were all often harassed by the police. It got to a point on our block when when it became almost a joke, but it wasn't a joke. But you see how we become desensitized. I remember one night we were all watching the Super Bowl. It's 1986. Why do I know? Because I'm a Giant fan. And we were all Lawrence Taylor fans. So in 1986, I was only 13 years old. I was born in 73. We were watching the Super Bowl at my friend's Christmas house. And we all come down from the building. And I don't know what happened. I don't know who called. Maybe we were being too noisy, making too much noise. And the cops come from, it was a one-way street where the cops come. But we've been harassed by them so much, you know what we did? We all just got up on the wall and spread them, even before they got out of their cars. To the point where, being that they knew we had nothing to hide, because we're spreading them already. They get on the loud scene and they go, yeah, you wise guys, just, just go home. You know, just go home. Um, so you grow up with these things, right? Um, then fast forward, I'm an, an assembly member, and I remember, so I lived on St. Lawrence between Seward and Randall uh, on the second floor of my mother-in-law's house. My car, one of the things that you get when, when you're in the assembly, you can have assembly plates. I had a, a Corolla, uh, not a Corolla, um, um, not the Corolla, the other one, a Camry, and they had assembly plates. My cousin Adam comes over to my house and we hanging out. And my mother lives not too far. She lives on Leland and Story Avenue. So Adam is mommy's nephew. We go, let's go see mommy. We get in the car, I got on Tim's, Timberland. We got jeans on, we got a hoodie, just like Adam. And as soon as we turned the corner on Seward Avenue, they were gonna make a left on, I believe it was, it was either Theory or Taylor to get to mommy. Whoop, whoop, you see the lights come in. And they roughed us up and threw us face down on the floor. And they asked, they checked in the car. They, they asked us if we have anything in the car. Um, 
but they were still checking the car without us giving them consent. Then they, then they say, whose car is it? I say, it's my car. Finally, they ask me for my identification, and as part of my driver's license, I give them my assembly ID. I'm like, oh my God, you should have told us. So in my mind, I was like, hey, I shouldn't have to, you know, tell you that I'm that in order for you not to treat us this way. You treated us like two Puerto Ricans who stole the assembly person's car. They couldn't fathom that a young guy could be the assembly. So I think more and more people started telling me about things that were going on in the community, and we were having meetings now with the community board. I remember Chief Jaffe, uh, she was um, she was the chief of um, the borough command at the time, and we met with her and others, and we were telling her, look, this 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 is bubbling to a point where, you know, something's gonna happen. When Amadou Diallo, and he was he was Amadou Diallo for the people who don't know was a young African um, man who came here from from Guinea to live with his cousin, Bobo Giallo, on Wheeler Avenue. My district office at the time was on Manor Avenue. And on February 4th, at the time, I'm an assembly member. It's my wife's birthday. My wife's birthday is February 4th, but we're with her family February 3rd. And at midnight, you get February 4th. Amadou Diallo then gets approached by four police officers at about two o'clock in the morning. And as he's pulling out his wallet, somebody yells gun, and they shoot at him 41 times and hit him with 19 bullets. All the while I'm at Jimmy's Bronx Cafe with my wife and her family celebrating her birthday. When we get home, it wasn't until very early that morning I get a call from the precinct um, commander, the 43rd precinct, and he tells me what happened, and my sister, who was a police officer. So I'm very empathetic to police officers. The first question I ask, I say, were any police officers hurt? And he says, no. And it wasn't our police officers. It was a street crimes unit that did this. So now I go and I call my chief of staff. We walk over to, um, to, to um, Wheeler Avenue, which is only three blocks away. I see all these holes. And I meet Bobo Diallo. And I go up and, and I see that Amadou Diallo was well read. He was Muslim. In his room, he had all these books on the floor. There were books not only on, you know, uh, uh, you know, metaphysics, science, math. There were books in French. He he was multilingual. English. He knew English. He knew, um, you know, he was he, he was not only a Muslim, but he had books on other, you know, on theology and other religions. This is a good young man. A young man that, when you look at it, even though he was from Africa, and I'm Puerto Rican, I lived in Saint, La you know, I lived on, on the other side of, on, on, on Saint Lawrence. The only difference between us, we were the same age, was maybe a, a half a mile of difference of where we lived. And then when you look at the fact that the police description, what they were looking for was a rapist, and the, the description was so broad, five. Five seven to like six one, you know, African American brown skin, right? That's more than half of the young, you know, age from I don't know teenage to like late twenties. The only thing is that there wasn't a rape in that community for almost a year and a half, and you know, you start to see inconsistencies in the stories. Um, on one hand. They thought that from their car that they see somebody who could be the rapist, but as they're approaching, they couldn't see that it wasn't a gun, that it was a wallet. So what, what was fascinating about it all is we lived in a period, unfortunately, at time politically, that whenever something happened bad to a Latino or a Puerto Rican, only the Latino leadership would come out. And when something bad happened to a Black, only the Black leadership would come out. And so here I am when the Latino elected official is an African young man. And so I didn't test the wind. I just knew it was an injustice, the actual federal um, uh, investigation, by the way. And so that became sort of my coming out. Even though I was elected in 1997, it wasn't until 1999 that I started getting all this attention. And that became my, um, the beginnings of a strong, 
relationship with the black leadership. When prior to that, there was always, if you look at going back to Herman Badillo, Ramon Aceveres, and all those pioneers, there was always a, a, a gap. There was always a divide between blacks and Latinos. But that became the, and that's how I became, I started getting close with Reverend Al Sharpton. In fact, today, not only do I sit on the board of the Hip Hop Museum, I'm the only Latino who sits on the board of the National Action Network, which is founded by Reverend Al Sharpton. And, and the respect that I get from the black leadership um, and the black community my whole life stems from the fact that I was unequivocal in seeking justice. And to this day, you know, Miss Diallo could die to Diallo, and I are still close friends. Thank you for that. I'm giving a really long-winded response. And that's exactly what this oral history is about, for you to tell us your I'm going to write a book. <laughs> awesome. Do a, do a movie. Ho hopefully you look up this oral history interview to yeah. uh, write some notes on, on your own uh, biography. <laughs> Give me one second. I got a reaction here from Gail. Of course. She says, oh, I love this. Thank you so much. <laughs> I sent Gail a picture of Herman's um, poster. And... That's his girl, she's still my friend. And that is Herman Badillo's widow. Widow, Gail Badillo. Give me one second. Of course. That is amazing you still have a connection to that old guard. And, and, and I was, I was, I have a luxury that most politicians don't have. So by the time that I, because I got exposed to politics at such a very young age, and because my father is who he is, and my mother is very political and home right. Everybody always talks about Reverend Diaz, but mommy was very much a part of all that. You know, George, if jo, Georgie Rodriguez fought with Reverend Diaz, but had nothing but a, a beautiful relationship with my mom. You know, my, he met my mom when my mom was a, a, um, a nurse's assistant at the Old Lincoln Hospital. You know, Georgie Rodriguez is one of the people who fought for the new Lincoln Hospital, the mm -hmm. down on the Old Lincoln Hospital. And so he, you know, what a gentleman, what, what a class act. Because a lot of people, when they fight politically, they fight with somebody, they fight with, with the politician of the family, and then they want to dislike the rest of the family. That was never Georgie Rodriguez. Can I call him Georgie? Or is George? Whatever you're most comfortable. Yeah. What, what, you know, so he was always, always mommy, 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 beautiful to my mother, kissing my hand. Always. What, what a, you know, class act. Even when he didn't see eye to eye about me. Um, and, and, and Georgie, in his charming way, he knew what he was doing. Because that's how you disarm, right? That's how you disarm the opposition. It's like, how much can Bobby fight against this guy? If it's like yeah. when Georgie gives him the side eye, but then he's over here kissing his wife's hand. You know, I, that's, that's part of his charm. That was part of his charm, you know. It, 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 he's smart in doing that. Um, uh, so I was in like political generational purgatory. Why do I say that? I, since I was young at the time, and this is, now I'm getting into politics in the early 1990s. There were no young elected officials. I was it. There was, you know, the, the Democratic Party had Bronx Young Dems, the Young Democrats, but there was not. There were. I had no peers, none, and and so I was able to see firsthand and learn from Vito Lopez from Brooklyn when I got to Albany. I was able to learn from Ramon, uh, from Roberto Ramirez. I was able to learn. From Carmen Arroyo, Jose Rivera. I was able to learn from Nelly Santiago, Olga Mendez. I was able to learn, um, you know, and be around all of these folks who, by the way, they fought for young people, but they were disconnected from young people. <laughs> they fought and laid a foundation for for future generations of leadership, but they were disconnected from that, right? Mm -hmm. And but by the time I started getting a little, now I'm the person who they who knew them and stood on their shoulders and paid them completely. But then now I become sort of like 
what every young elected official like in the in the early 2000s wanted to be aspired mm -hmm. to aspire to so i was like i was still young enough and still cool enough and hip enough for the young leadership to want to be around me but i was also very much connected you know herman Badillo. i i when i take this is a good one <laughs> so i told you guys how papi who is a herman Badillo acolyte but was mad at Herman when Herman didn't want to support him in 1980. In 1996, I decided I want to run for the New York State Assembly in a, in a, I'm, the, I'm the district leader, but it's a special election. Bobby had not spoken to Herman Badillo since like then. The same Herman Badillo who was the borough president who gave us the apartment Papi was so mad at him, you know, Papi felt like Herman, you know, turned his back on him. Herman felt like, you know, had his version, that Papi was disloyal. And then both didn't like Ramon Belles. They, they didn't speak to Ramon Belles since like the 70s, unless they were like fighting in the streets with, you know, different, when they were, you know. So now <clears throat> there's a new leadership in R Roberto Ramirez that we helped. We being Papi, and I was a district leader. And I felt that if there was going to be a vacancy from Hector Diaz, who was not related to me, who was part of the Ramon Velez camp, who was part of Georgie Rodriguez's camp, Hector Diaz, great guy, class act, but I disliked him at the time because he disliked my dad. But he became the county clerk. Now that leads a vacancy in the assembly seat. So I'm thinking, okay, there's a vacancy. I'm a district leader. I help Roberto Ramirez, and my last name is Diaz. So even though I'm not related to Hector Diaz, it, you know, I can, I'm an asset, right? And, you know, my father has all of, you know, like an organization. Roberto Ramirez did not support me. Freddie Ferrer did not support me at the time. Jose Rivera did not support me for that special election. Um, maybe because they dislike Reverend Diaz. So, but I am looking for support. The, the enemy of my enemy is my friend is how the saying goes. So I now go and I see, I try to reach out to folks to support me. At 22 years of age, I was able to get Herman Badillo, Reverend Ruben Diaz, Ramon Eceveles, and Willie Colon and Sarcelo together to support me. Ooh. That's a good one. That's something incredible. And, the, and what was crazy about that is before they got around to supporting me, I had to hear, which was a blessing. In Spanish, we say, sacando se los mm -hmm. You know, you got to air it out. You got you to air out the dirty laundry. before, Because these guys, they didn't like each other. Mm -hmm. These guys all had their version of how the other one mm -hmm. screwed them over. Mm -hmm. You did this to me. And you, and they were going back to like the 70s. And in 1985, you did this. And in 19, you know, 80, you did that. They were, and it was a fascinating to see that play out. Mm -hmm. And once they were able to go, because, because they were all there to support me. And, 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 and what, what even bigger than me, I think that they didn't like the new leadership of the Bronx at the time. Mm -hmm. So that was like, I was a beneficiary of that. Mm -hmm. But to hear all the war stories and all the things, and you did that and you did this, and, and to a point where I didn't like them because I only knew my father's perspective. Mm -hmm. But then when you hear their perspective, it's like, oh, wait a minute, Bobby, you didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, know, you didn't tell me that part, you know? <laughs> right? So, but then, and then they all, like, okay, now what are we doing? What are we doing with this young man? Okay, young man, you know. <laughs> After they, you know, they air it all out. Okay, what are we doing here? Are we supporting this young guy? I lost that race. But my, my, there's a saying in my family, we could win by losing and lose by winning. Mm -hmm. So I lost that race, but I was able to get, you know, to gain the knowledge and the respect of these giants. Giants. I was able to gain the, and it's not, and, and like they were the, they were the, the heads, but if you look at people underneath them, like Paul Mejias and, and Georgie Rodriguez and Federico Perez and Maria Roman, I mean, the list goes on and on, right? These are all people that ultimately I was able to gain their respect as a 22 year old. As a 22 year old, that, you know, who's going to respect the 22 year old when they've been around 
longer than I was born. You know, that ultimately benefited me, and the rest is history. Wow, wow that, that, that is great. And you are a great interviewee, because we exactly want that. We want you to <laughs> dig, and we want you to, to storytell. We want you to, you know, dig in those memories and let us know how you perceived all this. Moving on, and, but sticking with, with your uh, New York State Assembly tenure, uh, you know, in 2008, the Rainbow Rebels, why was it so important for you to find a new Bronx County leader? Could you talk to us about that, if you would like? I'm going to use this word, damn. <laughs> so, just like in 1994, when you needed um, a, a cleansing or, um, you know, in the movie, in, there's so many lessons in the movie the Godfather, and when they, when they were going to the mattresses, when they were going to go and have a, a, a war, they said, you know, these things have to happen every ten years or so. So, in 1994 was the last time, and so, 14 years later, in 2008, many of us felt like the organization under the leadership of Jose Rivera, who I have total respect for, and was one of my mentors early on. So, you know, he will have a different perspective. If we want to be honest, you know, I, I can tell you how I felt and he'll tell you how, how he felt. But for some of us, we just felt like there was no room other than for the people who were close to him or his family in politics, in Bronx politics. And, and um, you know, the word they use is nepotism. Uh, and... It was, and I, I felt also that, you know, he probably wanted his son to be the next borough president. And so there are things that occur that I don't want to get into. I don't, you know, I prefer not to. Of course. Uh, but I felt a certain way. I felt a certain betrayal. And so it ignited us to, you know, feel a certain way. And then other people started feeling a certain way. And under the leadership of Jose Rivera, there was an agreement the year prior to that where there were judgeships. And the majority of the judgeships went to either, you know, to other communities that were not African American. And we promised the African American leadership at the time, one of the leaders was Aurelia Green, the late great Aurelia Green. We, we, you know, not me, but the leadership promised look, it didn't happen this year. But next year, we will, so it didn't happen in 2007, but in 2008, we promise, you know, we'll, we'll seriously consider um, African, an African-American to the bench. So there was a whole thing on the, um, on, uh, on the, 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 the Bronx regions. So in the state of New York, there's the Board of Regions. And there's different areas and different counties, depending on the size, that has a region representative. Some of us wanted Dr. Betty Rosa, who is an incredibly dynamic and incredible intellectual mind. She is Puerto Rican. She's a woman with like six degrees from either Harvard or Yale. It's look up Dr. Betty Rosa for anybody who's viewing this. She ended up being the head of the regents and now she's the chancellor of the Department of Education of the state of New York. I, she was the superintendent of Community Board 8 that touched my assembly district. Totally impressed by her. She's a, an, an amazing person, a beautiful heart, tough as nails, and her CV, her curriculum vitae is second to none. Whether you, whether, I'm not just saying to any Latino, I'm saying to none. You get me some intellectual scholar in any community, Jewish, Asian, Black, Latino, Dr. Betty Rose's CV is second to nobody. So we felt that, you know, it was time for us to show our very best and Jose Rivera just had another candidate. 
So we were able to get, you know, a meeting with the speaker. And in that meeting, we, there were 11, 11 assembly members, and we were able to get out vote the speaker of the, the, the person that the county chairman, Jose Rivera won. This is my perspective now. This is my point of view now. Because of that, the, that the, you know, the county chairman didn't take that too lightly. The, 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 the black leadership, Michael Benjamin, Carl Hasty, who were assembly members, and Aurelia Green, sided with Dr. Betty Rosen. So now this happens before June of 2008. We got to start collecting, like not June, before May of 2008. We got to start collecting petitions. And in the petitions, you have to have who your slate is for the judicial candidate. Remember that I just told you that the year before, we didn't do a black candidate. Mm -hmm. And so we owed it, we felt, some of us, to live up to our word mm -hmm. to have a black candidate for judge. So especially for me, when I have three black assembly members who just voted for the Puerto Rican Dr. Betty Rosa, yeah. it, it, this is politics. Yeah. It's the way it goes. So I wasn't going to sway from that. Jose now felt like, no, I don't owe you guys anything. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do a Latina. Mm -hmm. it, it, this is fascinating because a lot of times we say, oh, if you Latino, you should always support a Latino. Or if you, no, you know, I didn't support the Latina, the Puerto Rican for judge, because A, had, we had a commitment from the year before, and B, I just had the three blacks vote for the Latina to be the, the regent. This is my perspective. Mm -hmm. This is the fascinating thing about politics. Everybody has their perspective. Somebody may say I was disloyal. Mm -hmm. And you can interview those folks. But we decided to go with um, a young lady who was an attorney named Elizabeth Taylor. Yes, oh. like the actress. So um, this was Aurelia Green's candidate. And so it, was, it became a long summer. And people labeled us the Rambo Rebellion. Why? Because we were Puerto Rican, Jewish, Italian, Irish, and Black. Unlike the leaders who all came behind mm -hmm. Elizabeth Taylor's candidacy. But, it, but you know, you know how it is. The candidate for judge, our candidate for judge, and their candidate for judge, they're sort of just placeholders. There's a lot of, lot going on, a lot of things being said, publicly or not. And so it creates this animosity. And so on election night, in the primary night in September, so Betty Rosa we get like in the spring, petitions start in May, the, the, the election, now primaries are in June, but the election is not on from June, July, August. The primaries in September at the time. So you have all oh, hot summer. Uh, and the media loves this, right? The media loves dissent. And the media is calling us and they coin us the, 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 the rainbow rebels. And to be honest with you, we embraced it. Yeah. We're the rebels. <laughs> you know, before you had the progressives now. Yeah. You know, progressives now say, oh, no, you are a regular. You are, you know, you are institutionalized. We were the rebels before they were the rebels, right? So we, and we won. We won. And then talk started happening about how is it that then we then take over the organization. So speaking of that, like I felt, you know, the reason why I find so tough in speaking about the Rainbow Rebellion is because I had such high regards for Jose Rivera. Mm -hmm. But that meant taking him out of the county mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, it's, it, it's, it's like Larry Holmes had to fight Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. He had to beat down him. I know exactly. Him, right? And it wasn't fun for Larry Holmes. Mm -hmm. He cried at the end. Right at the end. And so a lot of people were like, yeah, hey, we, we got a new leadership at Bronx County. Uh, for me, it was because of my filial piety. Mm -hmm. But you know, once we won, um, you know, we, we then we usher in a new a new generation of leadership with Carl Hasty becoming the county chairman, and then that ended up setting the stage in two thousand nine for me to become the president. Mm -hmm. Now, 
moving on to your tenureship as the Bronx Borough President, you have such a long list of legislative efforts that, that you worked on. But today, we are showing the fruits of two of them. One being the, uh, the Bronx uh, River Waterfront uh, Redevelopment. And, all, and the second one is the expansion of Metro North, which is going on now in my neighborhood over on Hunts Point Avenue. Uh, would you please talk about those two major efforts and any other efforts you think you would like to share with us? So be, being the Bronx Borough President was the honor and the joy of my life. It was it's the best job in the planet because you're like the, you're the president of your hometown. And I always say that if, if the Bronx was a person, you're looking at it. So I, I will, it, it, it allowed for me to finally be free as an elected official to be able to express myself, um, to, to allow for the bronze DNA, right? So when you're, when you're the borough president, there's only five in the, in the city of New York, one for every borough, and you're the only position that has to take your entire borough into consideration. If you are a, 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 an assembly member, a state senator, a congressman, or a council person, you only have your district. If you're the mayor, you have this, you know, your citywide, it's citywide. But, but, and when you have just your district, there are things that may go on in, your, in the South Bronx if you're the assembly person that you don't really, that, that, that you can't support if you represent Riverdale, if you're the assembly of Riverdale, and vice versa, and when you're the borough president, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta see the whole borough, and so you become a, a cheerleader and like a coach for the whole borough. But you also, um, you know, you, you you have to be convincing enough, and um, you have to be honest enough. Not honest. That's not the right word. Honest is a good word. You have to be authentic enough so that people can trust that even if they may not like what they're hearing at first about what you want to do in their community, that they know that you bleed the borough, that you bleed the Bronx, that you know that you would never do make a decision without their best interest, even though they may not initially understand. And so we kicked ass as the borough president. It was cool, and we were able to like you know call call he C and I and. And you know, we, I had a luxury that most borough presidents don't have. I never had any opposition from any any local elected official who was elected in any in all of my twelve and a half years as the borough president on any project. They all trusted me. Other borough presidents in other boroughs had split boroughs. And let's bring let's bring this back a little bit to Georgie Rodriguez, right? I had the full confidence. I had the full weight, I had the full support, more importantly, behind my back from the elders of different communities in this borough, which is by far the, the biggest accolade, the biggest, you know, to have somebody like my father or Georgie Rodriguez or Carmen Arroyo, who were doing this since before I was born, who did this with Giants, to, 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 total, to get to a point where they totally say, no, 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 we gotta make sure that Ruben's okay with this, that's our leader. You know, to, to, to enter a room and have uh, a Georgie Rodriguez, Mr. Bar President, in his, in his, huh? To like, to like, so look, you missed the borough president. It's George Rodriguez. <laughs> you know, and no, 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 no. We, and, and Georgie in his fervor, and just like Bobby and others, you know, that, that's missing that passion. We have been approached and we have been told that we can, and we will not commit to anything until our borough president, you know, that's how he would talk. And that, what, what is that doing? That's taking all of his authority and handing Damn, that's pressure. All right. <laughs> so that was the weight that I carried. That was, I never ever 
ever wanted to walk into a room based on it's not it's not what you support or what you don't support it's how you go about it right because you know people aren't always going to agree with you but if you do it in a certain way they respect you know why you did it even in disagreement so I never wanted to walk into a room and see a Georgie or Mommy or Bobby or whoever, you know, these elders look at me with a look of disappointment or, 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 or embarrassment. I've always comported and conducted myself, not a single scandal, nothing. You can research it, ever. Nothing. I never wanted, you know, to walk into a room and... And, and you know, and, and have a Georgie Rodriguez shake his head and look down. No, oh, he he would he would kind of stand up. Well, president, that that to me that was that was that added to my energy. That was that was what you lived for. If you cared, if you cared, I cared to have somebody like Georgie who was exposed to so much. To, you know, Korean War veteran, Air Force. Burnt down Bronx, bringing housing, you know, all the fights that they had, presidents of the United States coming to the Bronx, governors, this and that, to like totally hand over his authority. And so part of my authority and part of that I got as a tight with the title, part of my authority that I got as, as my with my personality, to, to have his added on and others added on. And I give you a certain, I give you a certain weight. Uh, so it's, I mean, and so you carry that weight, and then that was what you do with it. And so to your story, what you know, to your question, what do you do with it? We have big plans. Like we came in, you know, with a lot of energy, and we said, look, I'm work on the one premise here. If you want to do business with the Bronx, that's good. Or business, like if you want to do business in the Bronx, that's good. But you're gonna do business with the Bronx. And that was the bottom line. And so we came in, the unemployment rate was uh, four, over 14%. Over 14%. By the time COVID came around, the month before COVID, we were down to under 4%. During the years that I was in Borough Hall, we created, because we made developers. You want to do business? Okay, but who are you using for your windows? Who are you using for your floor, your tiles, your garbage bags, your painting? We got here, we got a list of Bronx businesses. And so that creates more and more jobs. We got to a point where we were able to create over 117,000 new jobs. 117,000 more people worked the February before the pandemic hit than the, in the Bronx than the, first, than the day that I took office. We created 55,000 units of housing. We were able to get to a point where we had about over uh, close to 20, Five billion private dollars invested in our We did over, you know, um, almost a seven hundred and fifty million dollars in restorations to our public parks. And then we thought big, right? We thought hip hop museum. We thought four metro north stations. We have the metro north tracks running through our Bronx for decades. It's been. It wasn't a novel. It wasn't like a novel uh, initiative. It wasn't my idea. We just dusted off the plans, you know, that so many people talked about before, but there was never any money. And then we took it to then Governor Andrew Cuomo, and then we convinced him to fully finance it to the tune of a billion and a half dollars. You look at the, the you look at the Brooklyn Sheridan interchange, you know, and all of this. A lot of this started with the restoration of the Bronx River, where I used to be one of those kids on the block they used to go to the Bronx River and swing over, you know, there was a Tarzan swing mm -hmm. on a tree right below 174th Street, um, Starlight Park. And we used to swing, and you, you brought old sneakers because you, you were a fool or because there were things in the water. The water was nasty and murky and people used to dump cars in the water. And um, we were able to, uh, when I was in the seminar, we were able to get George Pataki at the time to get the um, National Guard to come and take cars out of the water. They were mapped out by Youth Ministries for Peace and Justice. And then, you know, so we were, we were, you know, one thing gets to the other, gets to the other. I mean, think about it. We just, as the borough president, we were able to execute so much. 
that, um, I mean, not, you see, one thing that I did promise is that once I was done being the borough president, the only thing that I promised was that the Bronx is not going to look the same as it did when I first became the borough president. Now, a lot of people give me good credit for that. But if we want to be honest and have an honest conversation, there are some people who didn't like the change. But nonetheless, it was, it was a different Bronx. <laughs> You have a, a strong dedication to environmental justice, right? Um, and it's really notable, like you said, a lot of people do give you credit for that. And I think I wanted, can you tell us a little bit more about why you feel so strongly about that? Well, I saw that the need for it, but it came, again, keeping it in an honest conversation, as, a, as an assembly person, when you come from the Bronx, you tend to want to go into like committees like housing mm -hmm. and you know social services. Mm -hmm. If it were not for organizations in my district at the time, like The Point, mm -hmm. Youth Ministries for Peace and Justice, Mothers on the Move, these are all radical thinking organizations, but they wanted to clean up the waterfront. Mm -hmm. And so they were the ones who convinced me, people like Alexi Torres and Majora Carter and Paul Lipsy. These are people who convinced me to sit on committees like the Environmental Conservation Committee and the Transportation Committee. Mm -hmm. And that's how we was able to get the Environmental Bond Act, which was at the time $2.5 billion, but we were able to get George Pataki to give us some money to restore it. So we went from having cars dumped in the Bronx, give me one sec, to, look at this. You know, when people were talking about, you know, uh, uh, the new Green Deal, and yeah. we were ahead of the curve at the time. You had the new Bronx agenda, right? Um, that's not me. I supported that. But, like, for instance, you, you want to talk about having here on the head? This is a, <laughs> that's a 25-year-old Assemblyman Ruben Diaz Jr. at a press conference. That's amazing. Where, and this is at Starlight Park. And at the press conference, we had, this is, at that day, we had pictures of, cars that throughout the years were dumped in the Bronx River. Wow. See the cars? Yeah. And how we got a commitment from the state and the National Guard who had the equipment mm -hmm. to take out the cars. And now, fast forward as the borough president, as, and, and we have to give credit to former Congressman Jose Serrano, mm -hmm. who while we're doing all this, he's getting us federal dollars for the restoration. But fast forward, look how we have herring now. Wow. Look how clear that water looks. Yeah. And that's the same water that I said jump in when I was a young kid that had cars and muddy and, and just things. And now we have fish, herring. And um, one day I was riding, riding my bike and I had to stop by. And this was taken October 29th. 2016, and this is a young man that I didn't know, but he's fishing off of one of the little foot bridge at Starlight Park from the Bronx River. That's incredible. That's that. That's full circle. Yeah. It's it's one thing to to move somewhere and want to represent and get things done. It's another whole completely. Thin, and again, I have this luxury that most don't have, is to be able to be born and raised and then live the bad things and then get to a position of power and influence and then get to see that you're able to change for future generation the bad things or the things that needed to be fixed when you were their age. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's just a different you know, reward. It's just... My father, with all his advocacy, didn't wasn't raised in Sound. Mm -hmm. He was raised out of the Hawaii home. Mm -hmm. So even though he did good things for Sound, you, you, right? He never experienced as a young kid the bad or, or the South Bronx that he fought for, right? Mm -hmm. Ramon Vélez was born and raised in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Georgie Rodriguez was born and raised in Puerto Rico, right? So, so God bless them. This takes nothing away, but it's just a, I think it's just a different reward. Right? When you come full circle. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a new, 
identity, right? The Bronx identity that you're that you've created. Because I, I think a lot that um, I think about when I think of the pioneers of the past, right? They were able to work together because they had a shared vision of improving the quality of life, right? And then you're really a representative of the fruits of that labor of continuing on and creating this very prideful Bronx identity to want to continue to make things right. better because we have that shared vision and you and to be able to kind of continue to com effectively communicate that message to the community and to the Bronx. So I just have to say that. That was way better than I could see. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, Mr. Diaz, people have received honorable uh, honorary doctors. But you, you, you've not only, exactly my point, you've not only received one, several, and which is a great honor. You've done so much for the borough of the Bronx. Could you run through and talk to us, your, your appreciation, how you feel about receiving these doctors, and where did they come from? Um, Mercy, there's Metropolitan, um, Metropolitan, um, the college, New York Metropolitan um, College, um, I have two degrees that I earned, you know, by being a student from LaGuardia Community College and Lehman College. And then there's several other, you know, letters um, that I received from, from other universities or colleges. They, they, they're the ultimate recognition of, of appreciation by academic institutions. You, you know, I, I never wanted to be anybody's bozo or, or you know, anybody's clown. I just, I, I've always wanted people to respect me, even when I like to joke around and even when I like, I do the musical stuff, but I always wanted to be substantive. I wanted, I wanted my, you know, for, for wherever I serve to be meaningful. And when you go and you're invited to speak at a university at the graduation, and in many of these cases, they surprise you with, you know, with, with uh, these doctorate degrees. I never, I never earned a doctorate degree as a, as a student myself, but um, it's just the, the highest accolade that you can get from a, a, a uh, an academic institution. And so I love them. I hang them up in my office or in my, I have my little office in my apartment. I got several there and they're a badge of honor. They're a badge of honor, and and not not just for me personally, but in recognition of the of the work that we've been able to do in this borough, and and how we're like the little engine that could, we, we, you know, we're, we're the comeback kids. So it's not that they're just giving me that; they're they're acknowledging that something it has happened and continues to happen in the borough that so many people stereotype, and they do this from. You know, at a, at a um, at a venue and at a, an event where there are thousands of students and even more thousands of family members who may not have even, even stepped foot in the Bronx, but by doing this, when you get that recognition, those people that now start to get curious and they start to do their research and they start to see that a lot of the neg negative stereotypes of yesteryear no longer apply to us. I'm not saying that we're perfect. But at least, you know, by having that recognition, it helps that they now people start to see the Bronx in a different light. Was there any other, before we move on to the final question, uh, any other things you want to elaborate on or touch on something? No, let's just keep going. <laughs> Michelle? Um, no, I think I'm okay. Great. And, uh, you know, we, we always like to, ask this one question of all our interviewees, our narrators. Uh, what does the Bronx mean to you? Hmm. Wow, that's a whole show. <laughs> <laughs> We're ready for it. I, I, like I said, if the Bronx was the person you're looking at, it, like the Bronx is not even a place anymore for me. The Bronx is who I am. The Bronx is my DNA. The Bronx, right, is like, the Bronx is how I speak. The Bronx is my mannerisms. It's the way I comport myself. 
The Bronx is the way that, you know, I stay alert. You, you put me anywhere in the planet and I'm alert. You get that from the Bronx. The Bronx is the music that I listen to. The Bronx is the way that I dance. The Bronx is the way that I fight. The Bronx is, is the way that I eat. You know, the Bronx is where I found my love. The Bronx is where my sons were born. The Bronx is where I'm going to be buried. I already, I did, <laughs> I did something crazy this past um, Valentine's Day. I did two things. I upgraded. So Hilda's my high school sweetheart. And when I married her, I brought her, you know, a little wedding day. And, and she, God bless her. She's wore it with pride all these years. Oh, okay. But so I upgraded her wedding day. Shh, don't tell me about it. <laughs> but the other thing that I did, and follow me here, give, you know, give me a minute. I presented her with his and hers side by side burial sites and plants. Now, people may think that's morbid, but that's me telling my wife that we forever, right? right. <laughs> and it's a Woodlawn Cemetery. I'm yeah. buried here. You know, that's the Bronx. Like, I don't care if you bury me in a pink tuxedo with with uh, with turquoise shoes. Just bury me in the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the Bronx is, means it just it means everything to me. You know, what would I be without it? It's given me a life. I'm, as as an adult, I've had a job. I've had income. My kids never went hungry. I was able to be a provider. I was able to be, you know, um, an inspiration to either family, friends, or strangers. You, you know, no matter what, where it goes from here, it, I owe it all to the Boogie Down Bronx. Wow. That is awesome. Former Bronxboro president, Hilda Ruben Diaz Jr., thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to meet with us here today.